so great to see you. Um, and may I welcome Elizabeth Oldfield, who is our partner in conversation today. Uh, she is the author of this book, uh, Fully Alive, which is literally hot off the press, as they say, officially published uh, this week. So it is really amazing um, that you have found time to speak to us uh, today. Thank you. Uh, and um, I suppose for me, one of the things that is so interesting about this book, which is designed to reach people uh, on the edge of faith, people who might be intrigued about faith, but thinking about spirituality in the broadest sense, not just particular Christian doctrines, uh, you are very, very clear about the charismatic Christian experiences that are at the very heart of the faith that you are sharing through this book. Do you want to just give us a sense of uh, some of those defining moments? You refer to one of them as uh, as a hinge in your whole life. You know, um, it'd just be lovely to get a sense of of that uh, as we begin the conversation. Mm. Yeah, it's one of the most interesting things to speak about in public because I don't think people expect it. <laughs> There's not lots of uh, social permission, uh, particularly in the whole cultural Christian conversation. You know, you're allowed to like Gothic architecture and choral music, but speaking in terms immediately gets you put in the box, marked weirdos. Um, I uh, I became a Christian through a charismatic experience. So I was taken to a second to survivor, which is complex now, but wasn't at the time. Um, uh, by a friend, friends youth group, so invited to the youth group at her church, and came from a very kind of I would say a culturally Christian family, but not, it wasn't, there was no sort of active and living faith in our home. Um, and I prayed at the end of the week, having avoided the strange arena with all the people speaking in strange languages who I found quite scary and off-putting. Um, at the end of the week, I decided that there might be something in it. And so I prayed. I still can't talk about it. <laughs> uh, God, if you were there, would you show me? And you did and that yeah that that was how I came to encounter the love of God and um I had a major faith crisis about 10 years later and deconstructed as the jargon is now um and then found my way back and had quite a kind of austere uh Christianity for a while there and was quite nervous of the potential for abuse around charismatic experiences and um tried to have quite a sort of high liturgical intellectual practice but just yeah my um I didn't it wasn't satisfying <laughs> I um <laughs> there's this lovely Pascal quote the heart has reasons that reasons know not reason knows not and I really felt this I've sort of intellectually convinced of the existence of God again, but if I'm not actually having moments of encounter and experience of that love, then what is this all about? And so I think I let my guard down again. And now it's, you know, this Sunday I was dancing around at the back of the church and having a cry on the floor, praying in tongues. So it's very much um, a big part of my life again. And of course, as you say, for many of the people, particularly in the kind of culture that you inhabit of, you know, the religion think tank Theos that you were director of for 10 years, uh, these conversations in, um, you know, in, in very intelligent places, shall we say, uh, about faith. Um, that place of, of the charismatic um, is not expected, is it? As you say, it, it's it's OK, perhaps if you enjoy Coral Evensong, but um, speaking in tongues a bit less. Yeah, it was really funny. I did a project at the RSA, which is this big sort of policy wonk institution on the Strand. Its tagline at the time was 21st Century Enlightenment. And they had got some money from Templeton to have a think about spirituality, but they were doing it in a very RSA 21st Century Enlightenment way where everyone was a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a sociologist. And everyone was talking about these things as very distanced terms um that really brings out this mischievous part of me so I gave a talk about praying in tongues and you could see the energy in the room shift and suddenly people were actually interested because there was some skin in the game right and someone was prepared to be a weirdo and then a bunch of us went to the pub, pub afterwards and had these very very human intense real conversations and lots of people I'm still friends with so I think 
actually people are very intrigued and maybe more so now partly related to the psychedelic renaissance which is interesting but um yeah certainly in intellectual circles it is not high social cachet but uh yes you point in the book to um the increasing interest in psychedelics in the sense of people regardless of their position on faith are getting more interested in the significance of experience and that opens a way for the conversation about faith yeah i think that it's a huge shift in the spiritual landscape that's happening and uh, people may or may not be aware but the last 10 or 15 years have has seen a very renewed medical interest in um psilocybin and some forms of lsd that last had a renaissance in the 1960s because there is some very good evidence now that um controlled medical usage can be very effective for things like trauma or eating disorders or treatment resistant depression so the kind of stigma around psychedelics has been reduced by that i think and there's a lot of people who are outside the church or would not call themselves religious very spiritually hungry and a lot of them think that um you know magic mushrooms essentially is a way for them to connect spiritually and people are having these very intense experiences and lots of them are then saying i can't be an atheist but i don't know what to do next um it's very interesting times in that whole area but it's a way in because people then say well i had this intense experience i can't explain they're much more interested and curious about the intense experiences that i have and the frame around that and what that how that changes things and what it means but i have found it very fruitful um missionally frankly but also just in conversations and relationship building and i think that's so interesting in relation to apologetics which i guess is essentially what you're doing because i I suppose i've often been frustrated by and apologetics, which is only about convincing arguments, but never mm-hmm. about the experience that might be part of the picture. But you seem yeah. to be saying there's an openness to an apologetic, which is unashamed about feeling and felt experience. Yeah. I mean, I'm not even sure I am doing apologetics. I think I'm just doing testimony. Like, this is very old school <laughs> church lady stuff. You know, this is my story. This is how God has changed my life. Um, but yeah. Um, but just I, I was never very good at it and I'm now very bored with the idea that if you kind of have a riposte to these four intellectual questions then people are going to fall on their knees I don't think that's how people change their minds um, and they actually have existential yearnings and talking about that existential experiential element of our faith is often a much easier place to start how do you deal with the uh with those within the church who are pretty antipathetic to this. Um, You know, I have my own brushes, I suppose, on social media with um, sort of prominent thinking Christians who have no time for the charismatic whatsoever and will routinely kind of put up, I don't know whether we refer to straw men anymore, but, you know, Mm. they will kind of set up a caricature to shoot down. And if I say, oh, actually, I wasn't thinking of that kind of caricature of charismatic faith, then invariably they go silent. But what's your experience of that or frustration with that? I don't know. I think I have discovered that. And this and this is why I, I'm always approaching things from quite a storytelling way and also just from a place of curiosity and openness to other people I've done a lot of listening to other people and want to keep listening to other people including people who are sort of reading and engaging with me for whom lots of this makes no sense um but I think my tone is so clearly not trying to win an argument about it that people tend not to try and argue me out of it and if you if you you do I do encounter contempt but less and less and I think the, the wings of the church that really look down on it, bless them. They're, it's okay, you know, we all have our different preferences. The kind of harumphing and the superiority can be, you know, tiresome at times. But I also just feel a bit sad for people who don't have these amazing moments, right? I want, I want that for people. And, and also there's been times in my life where it, either didn't make any sense to me because I didn't believe in God or I was scared of it because I could see that it has the potential for being coercion and therefore I have also quite a lot of patience with people who are very unsure about it that's yeah. very scrambled sorry no I don't think it is at all but I mean you talk about 
the significance of the fruit of the spirit almost kind of infusing the way in which you're seeking to have this conversation um <laughs> I, I mean i hope so i that was what i intended to say it's okay chris because i'm so full of patience <laughs> But I think you are. I think you are quite or or you're trying to to do that. Um, something has occurred to me from my notes, which I can't remember right now. But but you 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 talk. Oh, no, no. You made a comment the other day about, um, you know, not gossiping is really hard, you know, to be silent in the face of gossip. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the only way surely is about a kind of deeper infusion with the fruit of the spirit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that and that is what. I came to the realization afterwards that the book is all about it's about formation it's about actually how do we grow in character how do we grow in the fruit of the spirit how do we be becoming the kind of people that I think the world needs in my language that I think God wants us to be and a lot of it isn't about letting ourselves be triggered and defensive and tribal and anxious but get, putting our roots down deep into love and seeking to sit in the presence of unconditional love as often as we can and let you know, let God change us and I feel like such a beginner and I am trying to be as honest as I can about how how much I fail in that quest but it's also very exciting adventure to be on and and how much would you locate that in Pentecost in the in kind of Pentecost as a sort of unfolding story that that mm. we're invited to take our place in. Yeah. Very much. I think there are the, there's these this twin twin birthdays of the church. I can't remember if it was you who was talking about this the other day, but the cross and the resurrection. And the way they demonstrate a God who has solidarity with the suffering and the way that love is stronger than death are just so foundational for my psychological robustness, you know. Um, but that without the sense that the spirit is with me, that actually the divine lives in me and is empowering me to learn to love my neighbor because it does not come naturally to me is everything. And if it was just an intellectual project or kind of ethical framework, I'm not sure I would still be here. <laughs> I need, I need, I need that relationship. I need that sense of presence, and I need that sense that there is more than we can see. And the the way these encounters with the Holy Spirit sort of quiet my analytical brain for a little bit and just remind me about the deep, deep truths. That is what sustains me. Yeah. Um, just a reminder to people, if there is something that, um, well, for example, that Elizabeth has said and uh, you're irritated by the question I follow up with and you have a better one of your own, please put it in the chat. Uh, or if there's a, a particular area you'd like to go into. Um, uh, one of the um, things that is intriguing, I suppose, as part of the story of the book is that you chose to leave this role as director of Theos. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit of the, the story of that decision and where the writing of the book kind of related to that and what that expresses? Yeah. I mean, that was a very clear sense of guidance and that doesn't happen that regularly in my life. It's happened maybe twice otherwise, but it was a very clear, every time I prayed, a sense that God was saying it's time to stop. And it's time to stop and rest, which was really challenging um, because I really felt like I wasn't supposed to go straight into another job. I wasn't supposed to have a plan, uh, which was, you know, challenging financially. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I eventually, with some <laughs> kicking and screaming, was obedient to that because I have learned enough to know that ignoring things like that is not a good idea um <laughs> but it I knew that probably writing was part of what needed to happen yet but it was only when I had had some rest and also because I had led through a pandemic and had two babies and was sort of borderline burnt out I think um it was only when I surrendered all of that professional identity and all of that 
you know, desire to be impressive or to be in control of my future or to know what was next. <laughs> um, that it sort of became clear what it was I was supposed to be writing. And it also has become clear that it would have been a very difficult book to write while still director of Theos, although I'm still very associated and make the podcast for Theos and love Theos dearly. But as the figurehead, there's a certain diplomacy required. <laughs> and if it's anything, this book is extremely honest. And I am um, not, not sort of being careful and diplomatic because it felt like the only way to connect with those outside the church was to be an actual person, an honest human being, not trying to represent an institution, either a think tank or the church, but just say, this is this is my story. This is what life looks like Where from where I am. These are the questions I'm asking. And this is the wisdom that I found. And I think you might find it helpful too. Yeah. But that's a, a, a big step. Uh, I mean, pride is one of the issues that you talk about in great depth within the book. I mean, you you use the, the, the traditional deadly sins as a kind of framing uh, of the different chapters of the book. But pride has a particular place. I mean, was that because there was so much that you had to dismantle in terms of your own identity to be able to write what you wanted? Yeah. Yeah, I think, so my definition of sin is disconnection is and fully aliveness is relationships, connection with our own soul and with other people and with the created world and with God. And pride is the thing that pulls us back into ourselves away from that connection. And we want to be invulnerable. We don't want to need anyone. We want to be impressive. Um, and there's, you know, it's a lifelong process, letting God heal what I am where I am proud and individualistic, but the allowing myself to look bad, allowing myself to be clearly unsure about lots of things, um, allowing myself probably to be under misunderstood by people, including Christians, because of the strange vocational thing I'm trying to do. Um, it was all part of the soul work that I had to do to be brave enough <laughs> to get it. But were you also inspired by a kind of frustration about how effectively Christians do often manage to have these conversations? Because I suppose I can't, I feel I've lost count of the number of times I've I've read uh books which say they are, you know, that this is a this is an apologetic, or even if it doesn't use the word apologetic, you know, this is a book for a non-Christian to read and come to faith. And I just read it and think I just I cannot imagine any of my atheist former colleagues or whatever getting beyond the foreword of this book, you know, and, and there, there seems to be a frustration in, for me at least, in terms of how effective often the church is about speaking beyond its own confines. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Uh, I mean, I spend, I spend most of my time not with Christians and sort of happily so. And, <laughs> uh, that sounds terrible. I just mean, you know, that is our, that is my husband and mine's both preference and calling. And, you know, worked at the BBC for five years and then have been in Westminster. And the thread in my life has been listening to these stories of culture and wanting to connect with them. And it does feel like the church is very often quite inward focused, not really listening to what's going on in the culture and scared unnecessarily in a crouch and one of the things I wanted to model while I was leading Theos was confident non-defensiveness that we can be re we can be really secure in who we are and in our sense of self and our identity and the gifts that we have received because it's not really about us but it's beautiful <laughs> we don't need to get tribal or snippy or scared or anxious because that's that's just a sign that our roots aren't deep enough right that we have not we have not received the gifts that are ours. Um, and when you are confident and non-defensive, you can get into great conversations. <laughs> you know, you can listen really deeply to other people and then have earned the right to be listened to. Um, but if you actually don't know what other people are thinking or their frames of reference or the language they're using or the questions that, you, that they are asking, then everything you say will just bounce off. And so much sort of Christian public engagement 
seems to me to be just Christians talking to themselves and making themselves feel good. And I have been part of that time, so I don't mean to be dismissive, but it actually takes quite a lot of consistent crossing of divides and actually listening. And I think respecting the people, like the, the, the posture of superiority, the posture of I have something to deliver to you because I am better than you is absolute poison for anyone listening or why should they frankly but going out because we love our neighbors and they are made in the image of God and we are called to care for them and I think listening is there's a there's a there's a, a phrase by a guy called Orsberg I think it's Richard Orsberg who said listening is so close to love for most people as to be indistinguishable and so listening is a way we love our neighbors and when we're really listening, not from a posture of superiority, from a, but from a posture of care, then it feels to me like it's much easier to explain where we're coming from in ways that make sense. Because then you have a relationship within which someone is willing to hear your crazy charismatic story. Yeah, because it's sort of fun. You know, actually, it's a really interesting thing to talk about. We are, we are, our eyes prick up at novelty in the same way that I live in a, a small Christian community now, right? I'm a, I'm a weirdo on many, many levels. And one of them is that I essentially live in a Christian commune. And that puts you in the weirdo box too. But being in the weirdo box makes you interesting. And if you are not defensive or defended or anxious about what other people might think of you, but instead just really willing to ask their questions, answer their questions, you know, be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have. That I just, I find it really easy to get into deep metaphysical questions because I don't, I don't know why. I mean, partly because it's a gift from God. It's a charism. It's just something I've received. But that this, this fear we have that being a weirdo means people will reject us. I don't think it's always founded. Sometimes being a weirdo makes you really interesting. And if think nothing else is working, then my, why not try this? <laughs> um, one of the things that I thought was so fascinating was um, when you talked about uh going into hospital to be sort of tested um <laughs> just tell this story because it, it it's remarkable this sort of connection between the physical manifestations that some experience in relation mm. to the presence and the work of the holy spirit uh, and how this actually connected in rather bizarre ways in some ways uh to your own medical situation at that time yeah i'm sort of hoping someone's going to read that section and help me explain it but i um i have a still slightly unclear what it is autoimmune um condition that gives me very weak joints weak wrists um and when it first started happening I was testing all kinds of things including MS and one of the things they were testing for was my neurological function and so I went in to have my um nerve conduction test it's called um done in a hospital and they put a little electrode on the end of your finger and then wait to see if you get a twitch basically so that the, these nerves are working okay and the doctor put a put the little thing on and said it's just going to be a little twitch and I did this whole thing and he said what what was that and I said that was that not what was supposed to happen and he tested several times and going in both directions from from the other the other finger and he said so that's interesting that has it ever happened before and I said yeah that's what I do on Sunday <laughs> you know, when I get to church when I feel like I'm experiencing the Holy Spirit that's what my body does uh I get these involuntary twitches and he just did not know what to make of me. It was really this like, right. I was like, is that a problem? You know, is it telling me, is it telling you something bad about my medical prospects? And he said, no, no, no. What, what we're testing for is, is lack of <laughs> neural reactivity. <laughs> you, you, do, you have the opposite of that. And I still have it now. I went to a, 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 a Christian conference in the States, but it was quite a, um, it was quite a sort of reformed, uh, restrained, hymns you know uh everyone standing in rows kind of conference and I was going through a stage of feeling very sensitized to the spirit and whenever someone was talking that and some and something someone said something that felt very profound or uh, it wasn't that sort of an, a, a cognitive thing happened like off some someone would say something and my body would do the thing and afterwards someone came up to me and said I hope you don't mind me asking but do, do you have a form of Tourette's and I was like I don't think so I think that's just what my body does <laughs> experiences of the Holy Spirit so I'm very relaxed about it now but, but you see I I found this really fascinating because um you know I, I 
shared with some of the people on this call previously that for me, uh, my legs shake uh, in a mm. similar situation. And, um, and, and, you know, that happened for the first time, the very first time that I really welcomed the presence of the spirit and I was responding to a prophetic word and it was all, you know, the, the, the kind of boundaries I thought that I directed, I was just, you know, engaging with the possibility of of lowering them if this was really God, because I didn't want mm. to, to miss out. Um, but I wonder whether even those of us who would own the label charismatic are often reluctant to name some of that and to share the stories of some of that. So we we like to talk about revitalised churches or, you know, churches that are alive, but we don't necessarily always go into the granular detail of what this actually means in terms of even individual bodies responding to what we believe is the presence of God. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is that all, that all of these things and an experience with God itself is beyond language and doesn't fit into any of our tidy institutional categories. And there are also risks of instrumentalizing it, right? It's not, it shouldn't be something you can plot on a graph of targets. It's not something within our control, right? The wind blows where it chooses. Um, but I do think that being, being more relaxed and more honest about it as part of our practice, as part of our faith can be really helpful. And I really, I really, I got my, my closest I got to really cross in the book is when I was writing about the fact that it's always been looked down on and primarily associated with the poor and people of colour and women. And there's sort of there's no accident that therefore it, it is of low social status, both in wider society and some parts of the church. And so part of me has this like, this occasionally comes out, this mis mischievous, almost political resistance to those kind of stories of wanting to put it in the places of power and wanting to challenge the narratives of what of you know what kind of reasonable rational self-contained people are allowed in our public conversations and say no Jesus was a weeper <laughs> there is a space for emotion there is a space for our bodies there is a space for what is beyond this very thin and narrow definition of reason and that's maybe where life is you know stop trying to put it in a box yeah perhaps that's part of the irony of why you know the spirit arrived in such pucker places as Chorleywood and Kensington, you know, the kind of push through um, that sense. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, well, um, it's almost half past one. So if you do have particular questions that you'd like to put to Elizabeth, please do contribute uh, in the chat. And if you don't, uh, I will carry on the conversation, um, which I'm enjoying uh, enormously. Um, I was going to ask you about these two real sort of crucibles for how you live this out your the community life that you've already mentioned but also your engagement with with the life of a local church is, is there anything more first on community uh, that you want to mention i suppose particularly in terms of how it relates to these insights about the spirit uh, you know is it the spirit which is really helping you through the arguments about the dishwasher or uh, mm. who's doing which chore are the kinds of things that you mention in the book yeah i mean i hope so <laughs> it's very um it's very unromantic living in community it's it's you know it is a place where ideal ideals go to die because you're confronted with the reality of your own i would say sin uh, and other people's up close um but i do think that you know the the promise of the beloved community this strange and beautiful vision that Jesus leaves us with is that we will be able to love each other. We will be able to love each other up close. We will be able to bear with each other. We will be able to celebrate when each other celebrate and weep when each other weeps. Um, and that the spirit is sent to lead us into all truth and to help us. So yeah, it's not that I kind of pause mid tense house night conversation about the dishwasher and ask for a prophetic word. It's not as direct as that, but um, my hope is that the spirit is always at work in us and certainly these again things that sound so nice and fluffy but are actually quite robust requirements if we're going to love each other like patience like gentleness like self-control 
these are these are the fruit of the spirit you know this is not, it's not just the, like the ba- bells and whistles exciting um dramatic charismatic experiences that are part of this story it is the ability to hold your tongue and the ability to forgive you know these things are really necessary yeah yeah and i think that's the tragedy isn't it when so many local churches become riven with with disagreements and conflict in a way that speaks most of all to a kind of spiritual poverty that has long abandoned the notion that these communities might be places of um a distinctive love and patience and kindness etc um you know it's kind of are we meaningfully distinguishable from the bowls club or the amateur dramatic society in our in our kind of core ethics yeah um, Chris, it might be worth, I just opened the chat and it looks like I can only send a message to you and or our co-host. So I just, it might be worth checking with people that they're actually able to. Oh, yes. I, I think people can chat to me, um, but not. Right. Not more publicly. You. But um, but I would say that um, people, I think they're just wowed by what they're listening to from you. <laughs> and therefore, uh, don't explaining. have formed questions so uh, uh i'm 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 happy with uninformed questions or ill-formed questions yeah so look it, it's I, I can't be any blunter than this if there's something you'd like to ask elizabeth please do contribute to the chat uh and uh and we'd love to uh to include that um you you paint a a very real picture of your experience of church both a church that you decided to leave uh and the local Anglican church that you're now a part of. Um, And again, I think there's something interesting about you leaning into the challenge and the kind of reality. Um, You you said about church, it's messy, sometimes embarrassing, theologically confused and absolutely beautiful. Uh, I loved that set of different characteristics. Yeah, yeah. Such a strange thing, isn't it? These communities we're part of and how, what they could be and what they are. <laughs> so it's a real, it's a real gap. It gives us discomfort. Um, but I'm more and more convinced we can't do without them. And the this is part of how we grow. We learn to tolerate the imperfection of community, and we learn how much our own imperfections are part of that. <laughs> Um, I don't know that it's possible to grow on our own. Um, you know, it it's a really complicated thing being part of a local church. And as I wrote about, they can really cause us pain. And lots of churches up and down the country and the church being in particular at the moment are in a lot of pain. It's really the 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 sort of decisions of with the bishops around the blessings of same sex partnerships, I think are driving a lot of difference to the surface in a way that's very difficult to handle well. And so, um, yeah, that keeping faith. I did a I did a lecture at St Melitus for Youthscape um, last week on power and transparency. And Eugene Peterson has this great line about how the church is too often tempted to be um, noisy, busy, controlling, and image conscious, and yet, in it, all its faults and failures, what if? this church, this body is exactly what God intended for us to grow up in Christ. And the paradox of that, the paradox of the imperfectability (laughs) of human community and the promise of it is something I really sit in the tension of quite a lot. Oh, no, look, people have found the chat now. They've uh, they've, (laughs) they've got the message. They've worked it out. Yeah, uh, so... um, Rona, uh, well, yes, with whom I lived in community in the sense that uh, theological colleges are very much um, Mm. communities where sin comes to the surface, let me tell you. I'm not referring to Rona here. Uh, (laughs) um, You were, that was the most passive aggressive way to raise that. (laughs) Rona, do unmute if you wish. Um, But no, in a rather more serious way, she says, well, her personal experiences of the spirit have become fewer and further between. A spiritual director once said that the feeling had possibly become an idol and maybe she was searching for the feeling rather than God. Do you mm. have any comments on on that? 
I mean, I definitely I write quite a lot in the chapter on this in the book about how I don't think peak experiences are are, are ne- for me certainly necessary but not sufficient, and that there is the potential for idolatry around them, and that the kind of they are not the narrow way, right? They are like the water table on the London Marathon, right? They're the, they're the they're the things that can keep us going on the narrow way. Is my my experiences of them, and I have probably needed them more or less at different times in my journey but however we talk however we think about it whether it's some sort of dramatic outward expression or something very still and quiet and interior so I also do something called centering prayer I don't do it enough but that's much more from the contemplative wing of the church these very quiet these very still moments of turning my attention towards God but the actual moment of a sense of encounter is exactly the same as it is in charismatic worship. It's all about wanting to connect. It's all about trying to quiet down or surrender this self-conscious, anxious, distracted, problem-solving part of my brain that's always on and and, and drop down into something deeper, right? Um, so I guess I, say, I don't think we can do without that. I don't think we can do without practices or postures that bring us into a sense of the presence of God. But it doesn't have to be fall on the floor. Shalawala, mala. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I have an apology for um, Claire, um, who is a member of two very loving bowling clubs. I wasn't meaning to be rude about bowling clubs, I assure you. Um, it's more just that question of... Um, you know, how do how does the church have something which is positively more than the very most loving experience of a of a bowling club or uh, yeah, yeah, so sorry, just to to apologize, Claire. Mm-hmm. Um, um Rod asks, um, you know, Trinity Sunday is now um approaching. Um what would you suggest for for engaging with people who are much more confident on focusing on the father? or the sun, less so about the spirit? You know, do you have a particular insight for how to begin this conversation with Christians who are less uh, infused, shall we say, about about the third person of the Trinity? The honest answer is no, because I'm not a church leader or experienced in talking to Christians about these things. And probably on this call, there is a lot of wisdom. So my suggestion is other people on the call <laughs> should <laughs> send their suggestions to Chris and he can share them or you could even open up the chat. Um, I'm sure there are lots of brilliant ways, but I would just be making it up at this stage. I know. Well, that's very honest. Um, and you've said your particular passion is is the conversations beyond the church uh, rather than within it. Um, what about the... Um, inspiration of mystics ancient and modern uh alan asks is that a kind of rich seam for you yeah very much so i have read two novels about julia of norwich recently um yeah i love this weirdo this weirdo words coming up a lot isn't it but the lives the lives that i am drawn to are often the people who are brave enough to be strange and the mystics embody that so deeply as do the prophets you know this this sense of just going along with the status quo which is some you know necessary and some people's theory of change and all of those kind of things but if god is actually real and loves us then strangeness is un- inevitable and pursuing these encounters, I sometimes think I'm actually a real hedonist. It, it's a real like, I don't take, don't get off my face on drugs, but I really do want to get off my face on every spirit. You know, I really do want to experience the love of God as regularly as I can. Um, and the mystics are so brilliant at reminding us that this is not a modern phenomenon, right? Just because it currently comes with projector screens and too many smoke machines that this is something that has happened down the centuries to christians who sought it and you've even been surprised by the place of 
the ancient practices of the church, even you know liturgical practices um, mm. within that journey, haven't you? Oh yeah, I, I our, our sort of community is very monastic inspired, and we use the Celtic daily prayer, morning prayer, and Compline regularly. And yeah, these these more meditative, contemplative practices are very much part of my life and my belief about how I change. I just don't also want to ab- abandon the charismatic for whatever reason. It feels like the story is usually charismatic or evangelical becomes liberal and contemplative. You know that those are the boxes allowed, and I don't. I refuse to. I refuse to believe that we're not able to receive the whole treasure and wisdom of the whole church. Right? That these things you don't have to pick a side. You don't have to pick a tribe. All of these things are from our brothers and sisters seeking to grow in the love of God. And I want to learn from all of them. And yeah, definitely yes to Compline and the mystics and lit- liturgy and to praying in tongues. Yeah. I'm just greedy, maybe. <laughs> no, well, I mean, uh, we're, we're doing a project at the moment on the history of charismatic renewal and how it can you know, inform the life of the church and the mission and the ministry of the church today. But, um, you know, the lessons from the Roman Catholic charismatic renewal, uh, mm. I think, are fascinating in that um, because uh, there is a real insistence there to say, you know, this is not about uh, creating a new uh, religious order within the life of the church, for example. This is about uh, a renewing work across the whole of the church. Uh, mm. And it's so important not to lose sight of that. And I think perhaps one of the particular challenges within the Church of England is that a renewal has often ended up being associated overwhelmingly with larger urban churches which are probably a bit more light to liturgy uh, Mm. and b that we've had this kind of emerging new church tradition called charismatic evangelical uh, and I don't think either of those are in any way the fullness of this kind of life in the spirit that you're talking about but we we become tribal and and I wonder I wonder is that anxiety that you spoke about within the church making us more tribal do you think is that something we're seeing in wider society as well people are retreating into their particular groups yes very much so and as you know I really go hard after it in the chapter on wrath because I'm very concerned that we as Christians don't give up on the ministry of reconciliation and our my sense is that the non-violent tradition which is almost entirely based on the words of Jesus is this extraordinarily transformative set of practices to be people who can cross tribes and love our enemies and pray for the people who persecute us and we don't practice it we don't see it as part of our formation or our discipleship and so we allow ourselves to get swept into this fight or flight response where everyone looks like an enemy and our identities are very unstable and we're very easily triggered into defensiveness and my cry of my heart is that we would model something different and we would not need to be with people that look like us or agree with us or remind us of ourselves which is this deep-seated human tendency that Jesus was very straightforward about but we would be people who can build communities across differences and resist the temptation to contempt and respond to contempt or dismissiveness or even outright attack with love and turn the other cheek and say I'm sorry you feel that tell me more about where you're coming from because the you can de-escalate these situations incredibly rapidly if you just choose to have a different posture and it is about turning the other cheek and we've forgotten that that's part of what we're supposed to do and I suppose we live in an age where technology encourages us seduces us in exactly the opposite direction yeah oh yeah yeah it is you know all all societies have struggled with tribalism and polarization but John Yates in his book Fractured makes this really great case that People like me syndrome, which is this deep preference for people like ourselves. It's universal across cultures, across centuries, but most healthy societies building guards against it. Ours has done the opposite. It's removed all of the common institutions and the common stories and the points of contact and has instead amplified the worst stories about each other and siloed us into smaller and smaller demographic slices. And so it begins to feel righteous to hate other people. It begins to feel morally pure to be full of contempt for people who disagree with us it's just something's gone very wrong there yeah and to go back to this question of experience within the christian life mark asks well 
is it the case that some kind of experience mediated by the spirit should be part of the everyday life of all Christians, um, i.e. a relationship with Jesus can't simply be an intellectual assent to certain truths. Um, I mean, is that essentially the drum that you're banging? I mean, I'd hesitate to use the should word because I just don't feel qualified to be telling other people how their Christian life should go. But my experience is that if this is just an intellectual set of prepositions, it doesn't have a lot of liberatory power. And that it is an encounter with a God who loves us that empowers us to love others and to change. Um, and so, yeah, like, I would broadly agree with Mark, but finding ways to communicate that, that aren't shaming people. Because I think there's also something to bear in mind that there's, there's a, there are temperamental differences about how easy these kind of experiences are to access. And I am just like emotional extrovert. And so with high tolerance for social awkwardness and the high appetite for intense experiences. So they come easily to me, right? Because my guards are quite down anyway. But my husband is an analytic philosopher and his formation is very left hemispheric. And it's really hard for him not to be in a more, you know, he, he basically, he finds studying the Bible really easy because he's always wanting to go deep into the Greek and the Hebrew. And that's a big part of his, his walk of faith. I don't find that easy. I find praying easy. He does not find praying easy, right? And there are certain neurodivergences that can intersect with this. There's just the ways that people are different and the way our formation makes these kind of experiences easier or harder. I am learning not to take for not to take for granted that the fact that they come reasonably easy to me is it's not a given for everyone. Um, possibly the last thing I wanted to ask you was you use this phrase spiritual core strength, which, uh, you know, a kind of the Christian faith is Pilates for the soul, you know, and um, I loved that idea. Um, I mean, is is part of what you're saying. I realise you're very careful not to speak judgment over any other Christian or the church or whatever. But are you detecting a need in yourself, at least, and perhaps in us to to become more intentional about how we develop this spiritual core strength so that we don't just have a kind of flabby spirituality that doesn't really give us what Pilates, I believe, would give those who practice it. Yeah, obviously, tongue in cheek. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's fair to say that all of all of us, all, all people who are seeking to be disciples of Jesus need to put our roots down deep into love and I do think we live in turbulent and anxiety producing times and if we let ourselves we will be formed by those times and by those stories and I am also formed by those times part of writing the book frankly is to dig deep into my own formation where I feel anxious about the future and the way society is going and my own life because I am trying to be formed by a book which says do not be afraid a lot and so I'm very um the reason the book is green and there's green everywhere in my life is the my life verses that my spiritual director and I come back to a lot are um, the, the images of the trees planted by living water that come up in Psalms and in Jeremiah and slightly differently in Revelation. And that is what I hope and pray for myself and I guess for the wider church, that we would have really deep roots down into love. So we would be steady and not afraid when the storms come or the droughts come, or the floods come, but able to create shade for other people and be a place of be a place of um safety and welcome and uh refuge for other people and if our roots aren't deep then we won't be that we'll just be like whipped around and fall over or start attacking each other which is you know easy to see Thank you. I can't make the tree metaphor work with that, except now I'm seeing like <laughs> Ents going into battle with each other. <laughs> I don't know whether that's better or worse than the uh, Anglican army on Doctor Who, which I haven't read, watched yet, but I've... Uh... Oh, no. Anglican paratroopers. Um, uh, anyway, something for us to explore on iPlayer. Um, Elizabeth, this has been absolutely fascinating. Uh, I am so thrilled that you took the time to speak uh, with us, but more more to the point that you wrote the book, because I think um, 
uh, as I was saying to you before uh, beforehand, um, Francis Spofford's book, Unapologetic, um, was so key for me and I think so significant uh, for people wanting to have this conversation about faith beyond the church and beyond those kind of cosy apologetic confines. And so his uh, endorsement of um, what you're doing, I think, speaks volumes. And, um, uh, you know, he he says that you're essentially writing the book he wrote, but for this particular cultural moment. And I think that is uh, appropriate high praise. Uh, so thank you for being with us.